Let's go again. Okay, uh, what I had in mind for uh, this after lunch talk is uh, to talk about another set of methods that have been used in the field of management uh, and more broadly in many other fields as well, uh, but are, I think, related to management cybernetics, even though they are usually treated rather differently, and that's system dynamics. Uh, I'm sure uh, you all are familiar with system dynamics modeling, right? How many people are familiar with system dynamics modeling? Nobody? Really? Jay Forrester, one, and causal influence diagrams? No? Oh my goodness. Well, you have exciting things ahead of you then. Uh, how many of you are familiar with the reports from the, uh, the Club of Rome? One. Only one? Two. Oh, my goodness. Well, I have found this to be the case. Uh, when I teach at George Washington University and I refer to the Club of Rome, uh, when I started teaching there in 75, everybody had heard of the Club of Rome. And now, nobody, none of my students have heard of the Club of Rome. So that's why I decided to include it in this um, tutorial because I think it's important and uh, even though things have changed over time, I think this is uh, very interesting uh, and useful literature. <coughs> so, um, I didn't realize it was going to be that newsworthy for you, but uh, let's go. Why is there that funny thing on there? Oh, I'll bet it. On the corner of the laptop. Yeah, the laptop. That's where we are. <coughs> okay, so uh, up to now we've talked about different ways of thinking about um, how to structure organizations, how to improve the performance of organizations. Now I'd like for a moment to speak about the environment <coughs> and the challenges that corporations are going to be dealing with uh, in the years and decades ahead. So you can think of this as the context of organizations. Now. The field of futures research began right around 1970 or 72, right thereabouts. And it grew out of something that was called peace research. And peace research grew out of strategic studies. And strategic studies was the result of the atomic bomb uh, because the concern was that the atomic bomb had sort of redefined warfare and nobody really knew how to think about international conflicts and warfare in the context of the atomic bomb. So Herman Kahn uh, wrote a book called uh, On Thermonuclear War, which created uh, a tremendous controversy because people said that if you think about nuclear war and you think that you have a strategy for fighting and winning a nuclear war, then you make nuclear war more probable. And what you want to do is to make nuclear war less probable because it would be so terribly destructive. <coughs> Excuse me. So Kahn wrote another book in reply to his critics called Thinking About the Unthinkable. And also, other people created the field of peace research, where peace research was aimed at developing methods for the psychological de escalation of tensions, which would ideally uh, create alternatives to warfare as a way of resolving conflicts. Well, after a while of developing peace research during the <coughs> late 40s, 50s, 60s, people decided that wasn't really enough, that you had to be not just against war but for something. So they invented futures research, which uh, was about creating a desirable future. <coughs> And one of the ideas that came up in those discussions of futures research was the uh, world problematique, uh, which basically meant um, ecological problems, population, environment, resources. So the basic notion was that world population is increasing currently at about 80 million people per year. So that means about every four years we add as many people as exist in the United States. Most of those people aren't added to the United States, they're added in other countries. But that's the rate at which population is currently growing. Now, the good news and the bad news is that in addition to uh, a rising world population, we also have rising per capita incomes. 
that's good because it means that people are living better. It's bad because it means that on average each person is creating a greater load on the environment in terms of consuming energy and resources. So you have a combination of more people uh, on a per capita basis using more resources and we're using up non-renewable resources like uh, oil, gas, coal, uh, in some cases water supplies, soil is eroding, fishing stocks are declining, etc. And this has been talked about for quite some time, like I say since about 1970. Um, the World Watch Institute in Washington, D.C. publishes a state of the world report that describes environmental issues. Uh, so the issue is pretty well known. <coughs> uh, there was also a uh, discussion in the early 70s of the petroleum peak. And this is the idea that uh, if you're using up <coughs> petroleum that's in the crust of the earth and was created millions of years ago, sooner or later uh, you're going to pass the peak and you're going to be consuming faster than you're finding new resources. And the claims have been that um, we've now passed the petroleum peak or in the process of passing the petroleum peak somewhere in the early 2000s. That is, we're consuming petroleum faster than we're discovering new reserves. And then you have competition for water resources uh, in many countries, overfishing, soil erosion, etc. Climate change uh, is something that's been in the news lately thanks to Al Gore. Uh, you can think of climate change as a problem of absorption of the effects of human activities. So that you have two issues. You have declining resources and overproduction of less desirable things. And climate change, if it raises uh, sea levels, could lead to a loss of coastal land and a displacement of populations. Well, all of this was uh, sort of called to the attention of the general public in 1972 with the publication of a book called The Limits to Growth. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about the origins of this. There was a man named Aurelio Pecce, um, an Italian industrialist, I think he worked for Fiat, who served on a number of corporate boards and was involved in politics to some degree. And he became very concerned about the world problematique, this interrelated set of sustainability issues. And he found that when he talked to politicians, they would say, yes, yes, Aurelio, that's fine, but we're concerned about the next election. And then when he would talk to his corporate friends, they would say, yes, yes, Aurelio, that's very important, but you see, we're concerned about our uh, profits uh, in the next quarter. So he said, well, what we really need here is if the, if the leaders of our large organizations aren't going to pay attention to this problem, what we need is something like a voice booming out of the clouds saying, repent ye sinners, for doom is at hand. But he says, we live in a secular age, nobody's going to pay any attention to that. But then he thought, if we could get a computer to say it, maybe people would listen. And that was his overt and deliberate strategy. <coughs> so he got together some friends in Rome uh, and they invited Jay Forrester. Uh, now let me tell you a little bit about Jay Forrester. How many of you are familiar with the life story of Jay Forrester? One. Okay. I had no idea this was going to be so newsworthy. <laughs> okay. I'm sure he's retired now as a professor at MIT. Uh, he was an electrical engineer who was involved in computing in the very early days. And one of the things he invented was a magnetic core memory, uh, which is a sort of grid. And then at each intersection, there was a, a little iron uh, donut. And the wires passed through it, and it, you could change the polarity or the, uh, the magnetism of this little thing by passing a current through it or sensing a current. So uh, it would record zeros and ones. And that was the first non-vacuum tube uh, computer memory. Then he got a patent on it and sold it to IBM, I think, and bought himself a cattle ranch in Nebraska where he grew up. But he did many, many other things. Uh, 
He was in charge of the Whirlwind project. Now, the Whirlwind computer was uh, an advanced um, computer project at MIT. The Whirlwind computer is now in the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. It had an impressive list of firsts. Uh, it was the first uh, keyboard entry computer as opposed to punch tapes or punch cards. It was the first light pin entry, which is sort of the forerunner to a mouse. <coughs> it was the first multitasking computer. In other words, the computer could do one thing for a while and then another thing for a while. Um, and other firsts in the computer. And in a sense, it was sort of the PC 20 years earlier. Well, after he created this very nice computer, <coughs> he said, well, okay, so what are we going to do with it? And he decided to model complex systems. So he invented a computer language to run on the computer, and he called it Dynamo. And it was a language for dealing with feedback loops, positive feedback loops and negative feedback loops. I'll explain that in a moment. Okay, so now he had a computer and he had a software program to run on it. He says, how can we show people that this is useful? So he says, business cycles. So he wrote a book called Industrial Dynamics that told how you could analyze business problems using uh, positive and negative feedback loops using Dynamo running on his computer. And that was fine. <coughs> and that was influential. And then they had a visiting professor at MIT who was the former mayor of Boston. And they would, they had an office next to each other and they would have lunch from time to time and the mayor of Boston described to him the problems that he had as the mayor of Boston. He was a Democrat, so his job was to deliver services to the poor. And as he delivered services to the poor, more poor people moved into Boston. And in order to pay for those services, you had to raise taxes. So he raised taxes so the rich people moved out to the suburbs. Well, this was a pattern that was repeated in many cities across the United States. And so Jay Forster wrote it up in the form of a computer model uh, where you could test policies. And it turns out that if you want your city to prosper, the thing that you do is that you provide tax breaks to the rich, no services to the poor, the, poor move, uh, the rich move in, the poor move out, and everybody prospers. Uh, the city prospers. Uh, well, needless to say, <coughs> this set of recommendations or implicit recommendations was not well received on academic campuses in sociology and political science departments, which tend to be populated by liberal academics, et cetera. So it was very controversial. But it did clearly define a, a problem that existed in many cities across the United States, and it made the causes and consequences of alternative policies quite clear. So, in my view, it was useful. So with that background in uh, computer modeling of social systems, Jay Forster was invited to a meeting in Rome of uh, the Club of Rome. And on the airplane coming back, he wrote up a quick computer model called World One in which he combined a number of trends. And this was the great innovation of World One. And that is that previously, when people looked at trends in the future, they extrapolated the trends independently. So you would either, you would look at population and extrapolate the trend, you would look at oil supplies and you would extrapolate the trend, you would look at population and you would extrapolate the trend. Nobody put it all together. Well, Jay Forster did in his rather short computer model, uh, indicated how he thought that each of these variables would affect the other. And then he revised it as World Two. That was published in a book called World Dynamics. Nobody paid any attention. It was a major intellectual breakthrough. Nobody paid any attention. So Petchy, <coughs> being the businessman that he was, decided what we need is more marketing. So the Volkswagen Foundation gave a grant to some of Jay Forster's younger colleagues, and Dennis Meadows, Donella Meadows, Jorgen Randers, and some others. And they came up with an even bigger model called World 3, which is described in a book called uh, Dynamics of Growth in a Finite World. And then Donella Meadows, who is a very capable writer, wrote a short little paperback book called The Limits to Growth, which basically just said that on a finite planet, if growth 
is continuing, sooner or later it's going to have to level off. And if it doesn't level off soon enough, you can overuse your environment and then have a period of overshoot and collapse. So they did that work and it was published, uh, The Limits to Growth, in 1972. And there was a press conference in Washington, D.C. in the Rayburn House Office Building. Uh, it was thoroughly covered. It was an absolute sensation. Uh, people all across the country were talking about it. They translated the book into many languages, sent them off to heads of state, secretaries of state, and so forth. It was a very big ruckus. And what ensued was an ongoing debate between economists and ecologists. Where economists have a mental model that says <coughs> that the price mechanism will solve any problem. That is, if uh, oil becomes scarce, prices will rise, substitutes will be competitive, no problem, um, and etc. In other words, the price mechanism can solve any shortage problem either by making limited supplies more expensive or by bringing alternatives to the market, whereas the ecologists were thinking in terms of limited resources, population, etc. And this debate raged for quite some time. Uh, I guess you could say it's still going on, but uh <clears throat> in any case, for ten years, uh, other people did their own global models based upon examining the models, which were clearly defined, uh, which was the great advantage of a computer simulation. Every assumption you make is clearly stated, so you can change any of the assumptions that you want. And they did a series of studies, uh, and at the end of ten years, uh, they published a book called Groping in the Dark. Uh, this is kind of a funny title. Let me explain where it comes from. It comes from a joke. About a, blind, uh, about a drunk who's um, a, a, a traveler comes by this drunk who's on the ground uh, underneath a, a, a light pole. And so the observer says, what are you doing? He says, I'm looking for my keys. And then the observer says, where did you drop your keys? He says, over there. He says, but why don't you look over there? Well, because this is where the light is. Okay. The point being that academic disciplines give you theories and methods which illuminate some problems and shed no light on other problems. And so it's very common for academics to look underneath the light because that's where their theories and methods work and to simply disregard the problems that are off in the dark. So what groping at the dark means is that these people are trying to solve important problems even if there are no existing disciplinary methods that uh, illuminate or shed light on them. But in this case, they had system dynamics uh, and so that's what they were using uh, and other simulation methods. Then in 1992, uh, the original authors of The Limits to Growth, uh, Dennis Meadows, um, uh, Jorgen Randers, etc., published Beyond the Limits. And the claim in that book was that we had gone beyond carrying capacity. That is, that if, if you assume a certain carrying capacity of the planet, that population had now passed carrying capacity, implying that you were then in a period of overshoot and at least partial collapse. <coughs> this book and this report received almost no attention at all. <laughs> I went to the presentation of this book in Washington, D.C., and uh, it was noteworthy for the uh, lack of interest by the general public in it. Well, let me go back a little bit. Uh, I guess I'm getting ahead of myself and tell you a little bit more about what these models say. Okay, so the advantage of the limits to growth is that it went from extrapolating independent trends to how the trends affect each other. Uh, the assumptions were clearly stated, that's the great advantage, and alternative assumptions about resources and effectiveness of recycling were tested. So here's the basic model. Uh, if you, this is in your notes if you look at it. Uh, basically you have uh, industrial, oops, 
You have industrial capital, which leads to more machine tools, more productive capacity. Some of your industrial output goes into service capital. That would be hospitals, hospital beds, uh, operating rooms, uh, schools, uh, classroom equipment, etc. Some of your industrial output goes into agriculture. That would be uh, combines, irrigation equipment, uh, storage for grain, etc. So your industrial output is your productive capacity. And to the extent that you reinvest in machine tools and so forth, you're increasing your ability to produce even more. And as a result of all this, you get service output. Some um, of your industrial output goes into consumer goods. Uh, you get food, et cetera. <coughs> but this is the big loop that drives the growth. Now here's another view of the same model. So you have industrial capital, service capital, agricultural capital, uh, and these all produced consumption. And some of your industrial capital is reinvested in the other sectors. Now the way system dynamics works is um, you do a reference run. That is, you take all of your initial variables and uh, equation structures the way you think they are based on the past, that is, you try to reproduce the trends up to the present, and then you let the model run off into the future and see what it produces. And what you see here is that population, now this goes from 1900 to 2100, so we're just past 2000, right about here. Uh, so population increases and then peaks about 2025 and then declines. Persistent pollution increases and then declines. That's the result of industrial output per capita. Here's industrial output per capita. Uh, food per capita increases and then declines. And non-renewable resources, that'd be mostly petroleum, natural gas, coal, and so forth, they decline. Okay, so that's the World 3 reference run uh, that you can then play around with. And they did. So they said, okay, let's assume that we're wrong about the amount of non-renewable resources and there's twice as much petroleum, natural gas, and so forth as we think. What's the consequence? Well, it gets you a little bit of time on your peak on population so that rather than 25, you get almost up to 2050. Uh, but it doesn't get you all that much. Uh, meanwhile, your persistent pollution goes up quite dramatically. You could think of CO2 as part of persistent pollution, although this didn't rep uh, report didn't mention CO2, I think, in 1972. Then you say, well, okay, suppose we really underestimate it and there's ten times as much oil and natural gas as we thought. Once again, you get really very little. You get another 25 years over the reference run. Your persistent pollution goes crazy. Uh, you can see your natural resources don't decline as fast. So th the interesting thing is that you can have limits either in terms of your inputs or in terms of your outputs. The, the inputs being the supplies of resources and the outputs being the ability of the environment to absorb them. Well, you can make other assumptions. Uh, one of them would be recycling technologies. Uh, and you could limit family size. So what is this? Equilibrium to adaptive policy. So what you see here is that they're able to have population level off in a nice fashion. Uh, industrial output levels off. Persistent pollution peaks and then declines. Uh, food per capita rises and then levels off. Okay, so they, that you get an increase in resource recycling reduce persistent pollution, increase land yields are combined with social policies that stabilize population, industrial output, and so forth. As in the adaptive technological runs, additional technologies are assumed to be implemented in 1975. Okay, so this was published in 1972 and the hope was that people would read the book, change the policies, and by 1975 the appropriate policies would be implemented and we would be able to achieve stability uh, in approximately uh, 2050.
<coughs> I say, well, okay, suppose our, in, our leaders are not quite as fast on their feet as we would like. Let's suppose that all these policies are implemented by the year 2000. Uh, here, population does peak and then decline. Food per capita goes through a blip. Uh, persistent pollution does this. Industrial output does that, so forth. So the, la the longer you wait to implement these stabilization policies, um, the more troubles you have during the transition. So that was the model in 1972. Then they did Groping in the Dark, and it summarized the results of seven global models created in the ten years following the limits to growth. The models were made by people in different countries using different methods. All came to the conclusion that growth could not continue indefinitely on a planite planet. Uh, Don Enamel has always expressed surprise that that was a controversial conclusion. Uh, the further conclusions were that basic needs can be met into the foreseeable future for everybody on the earth, but that basic needs are not being met now due to social and political structures, values and norms, not physical scarcities. They concluded that we do not have complete information on the degree to which the environment can absorb further growth in human population. That's sort of a restatement of the current uncertainties over climate change and global warming. But it was said as long ago as 82, if it wasn't obvious before. Uh, they also concluded that continuing present policies will not lead to a desirable future. The world's socioeconomic system will be in a period of transition to something different. Nobody knows exactly what, but that we'll be in a period of transition, which I think we clearly are. Policy changes made soon will have more impact with less effort than the same changes made later. <coughs> no set of purely technical changes is sufficient to bring about a desirable future, according to the simulations. Interdependencies about people and nations uh, are greater than commonly imagined. That is, the effects that you have on others are greater than you imagine. Decisions should be made within the broadest possible context, that is, thinking on a global scale, and that many plans and programs are based on assumptions that are impossible, one of them being unlimited growth on a finite planet. Okay, so in 1992, they redid the model, and Dennis was asked, Dennis Meadows, the chief modeler, was asked, what's the difference <laughs> between 1992 and 1972? And he said that in 1972, he was assuming that the limit would be resources, that by 1992, it looked like the limit was going to be the ability to absorb the output of industrialization. And so s the current debate over CO2 seems to be consistent with that. <clears throat> so system dynamics as a way of analyzing social systems or organizations focuses not on a production process, not on a model based on the neurophysiology of the nervous system like the viable system model, not on a group facilitation method like interactive planning, the technology participation, or interactive management, Warnfield's method, but rather on the assumption that you can conceptualize systems in terms of positive and negative feedback loops. And uh, there's the further claim that these feedback loops produce behavior which tends to be counterintuitive, which is another way of saying people don't normally think this way. Uh, but positive and negative feedback loops is a more productive way of modeling. And so consequently, if you use system dynamics analysis to understand an organization or the environment that the organization is operating in, that will lead to better decisions. Any questions so far? About the, yes. Uh, 
Right. We're starting to get into the political situation compared to the in the United States and in Europe. Okay. Yeah, the question is about declining population in Europe and the United States and relative to Asia. Well, first, I agree that uh, the birth rates in Europe are below replacement and also in Japan. Uh, in the United States, they're not. The United States is growing pretty strongly, uh, primarily as a result of immigration, uh, but also our birth rates are not as low as Europe. Um, so the U.S. is still growing. Um, it is certainly the case that as the economies of China and India and Pakistan and others uh, continue to grow, they will be a larger part of the global economy. Uh, there's a, an interesting statement from Henry Kissinger when he was National Security Advisor and he was referring to the U.S. position when he was National Security Advisor relative to the United States position at the end of World War II. And he says, you can't do as much when you have one quarter of the world's uh, industrial output as you could when you had one half of the world's industrial output. So clearly the United States share of the global economy has declined from, I guess, its peak soon after World War II when many other countries were destroyed, uh, to the present day where it's the U.S. share of the global economy continues to decline. There are, however, other factors uh, that relate to global dominance, if you want to call that, and that is th the ability to act. Uh, Europe had a problem in acting in the Balkans during the time of the war between Serbia, Croatia, Bosnia, and so forth because they had trouble coming to agreement on what they wanted to do. And finally, the United States and NATO uh, decided to bomb the Serbs in Bosnia, and which ended the conflict surprisingly quickly. <coughs> so there's that question of the ability to act. Um, the question, I guess, would be what would be the foreign policies that would be adopted by China and India? Uh, when they become larger economic influence. I really have no idea. Uh, somebody else could speak to the question better than I. But I don't think there's any doubt but that the U.S. influence will decline. And I'm not sure that the American people are opposed to that. I, I mean, uh, I think the adventure in Iraq has certainly limited resources available for investment in the United States. And if that burden could be shared and uh, better decisions made as to when and where to act, uh, I, I think that would be a benefit to everyone. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. So the, the United States share of the global economy is clearly declining. Uh, what will happen from that, I don't know. Uh, I personally have great faith in the global university community that is now made possible by the internet and international travel. So I'm hoping that academics around the world will cooperate with one another on research, on education, on public service. Um, one of the things we have in the United States is think tanks, student think tanks where students write papers about significant policy issues and discuss them. And there's an institution that coordinates all this. It's called the Roosevelt Institution. Uh, so I'm encouraging people in other countries to set up student think tanks at universities in other countries and to share their results. And that if we begin cooperating at that sort of educational, intellectual level to try to understand problems and how we can work together, Ideally, that will set a context in which the political and economic issues will be easier to resolve. And I don't think there's as much attention that's been given to promoting the development of the global network of universities um, as should be the case. So that would be my answer to that long-term problem. Yes? What do you mean about the Lisbon strategy? Do you know the gap between the United States and the Union of 
My understanding of the Lisbon thing was that Europe decided to increase their investment in research, and they haven't done it. Um, that is, they wanted to close the gap uh, between Europe and the United States on how, what fraction of the GDP was invested in research. And they passed resolutions and came to an agreement that, yes, this is what Europe should do, but the budget hasn't followed is my understanding, that it, it was a declaration of intent that has not been implemented. And those in the research community remind political leaders of this. Uh, so it's been a very useful device for the academics in Europe to, when they request money from the government for research, to say, oh, by the way, you know, you're falling farther and farther behind your Lisbon Declaration. Yes? The problem seems to be big, but um, to what degree has the government start to adjust or uh, implement uh, some of the changes in their policy uh, to, to try to uh, lessen the, the impact of the, you know, hitting the governments around the world, <coughs> particularly the United States? Well, I'm more familiar with the United States than other countries. Um, the, the question was, uh, to what extent have governments decided to implement <laughs> these pro policies? The current administration is um, somewhat resistant to this way of thinking. Um, both the United States government and the Catholic Church have lobbied against birth control um, because the U.S., because they don't want to promote abortion, the Catholic Church for other reasons, I, I don't know, maybe the same reasons. But those have been two strong influences on not limiting human population or not stabilizing human population. Now, in terms of the environment, um, this administration has been more pro-oil company than pro-environment. Um, the Democrats tend to be pro-environment. The Republicans are pro-industry. Um, so that may change after the next election. What is happening in the United States is that mayors and governors are beginning to act on their own and to share policies to try to limit uh, CO2 emissions, um, et cetera. But there is so much that could be done in the United States just in terms of promoting mass transit and redesigning cities to be more fuel efficient. Um, <coughs> so many, many things can be done. It, it seems to me that the public in general is becoming more aware of the problems once again. But it's been 35 years since the Club of Rome study. What surprised me was that after the, the big debate in the United States in the 70s about the Club of Rome projections, all of a sudden SUVs became popular. I mean, this is a complete reversal of thinking. I just, how, how could we do that? Uh, it's like we just completely forgot this uh, ecological sustainability orientation. But now we're going back in that direction. We are still in the thinking stage. Yes, un unfortunately. That's why I've, I've begun talking about the Club of Rome again in my classes, because it seems to have just completely vanished uh, in the general population in the U.S. But, but the other thing which probably uh, the, the Club of Rome has not taken into consideration is over the past 30 years, a lot of new technology, new opportunities has uh, you know, uh, opened up. Um, so I just right. heard all the, those uh, issues. Yeah, windmills and solar collectors and things like that. Well, the, the great advantage of the Club of Rome models is that it's all clearly stated. So, you know, you want to change some assumptions, by all means, change the assumptions and uh, to reflect uh, recent technology. And uh, th there are some people who are looking at the models again. Mostly students, I think. Other questions about, yes? Yeah, you mentioned World 3. Yes. Um, has the model evolved in the meantime, not so much in terms of new values and parameters, but mm -hmm. the policy for change? Mm -hmm. Have you real fundamental changes that are all the factors that were not, were not really taken into consideration in the model, the World 3 model? I don't know of any uh, fundamental changes to it. Um, it, Dennis Meadows did sort of completely rework it in 1992, but um, 
he didn't talk about major structural changes at the time. I'm sure an internet search would turn up something, but uh, I don't know of any major fundamental changes. Other questions? Yes. To change the which the prediction curve, yeah. ah, well, sure. I mean, th that's that's what the Club of Rome looked at was what are the things that you can do to change the outcome, uh, limit population, reduce per capita consumption of resources, increase recycling. Um, I guess those are the main things. Uh, uh, use renewable supplies of energy like. Uh, uh, windmills, solar collectors, and so forth, assuming solar collectors generate more energy than they consume in the production <coughs> of, the, of the chips. Uh, but there, yeah, there are many things that can be done. Uh, what I find interesting is that there are other studies that come up with rather similar conclusions. Um, Heinz von Forster, uh, who sort of invented second order cybernetics, did a study of human population in 1960, uh, and it was published in an article in Science Magazine called Doomsday, Friday, 13, 2026. And uh, this was eight years before the book The Population Bomb was published by Paul Ehrlich. So what Heinz did was to just extrapolate uh, over time the trend in human population and he looked at doubling time. In fact, his study introduced into demography the concept of doubling time. Uh, he was a physicist, and so doubling times and having times or half-lives are common to physicists, but they were new to demographers. And what he found was that if you take the doubling time of human population over a period of thousands of years, you get a very linear graph relative to time. And the interesting thing is what happens when that line intersects the horizontal axis? Well, what that means is the doubling time goes to zero, which is another way of saying population explosion. So if we diverge from the current trend and go towards stability, it will be a dramatic change in a very long-term trend. Well, he published this article in Science Magazine, and the demographers jumped on it <laughs> and said it was ridiculous, et cetera, et cetera. And what ensued was a debate in the letters section of Science Magazine that was the most entertaining scientific argument I have ever read. Um, and um, oh, there are many facets. I wrote an article on this, The Scientific Revolution in Demography. It's on my website if you want to look at it. All the papers are on my website. And uh, basically, the, the fascinating thing about it was that if you take population with respect to time, the demographers were of the opinion that as development increases, population decreases. They looked at Europe, okay? Europe developed, Japan, population decreased. Von Forster says if you look at the long term trend, development encourages population growth because population can be viewed as an aggregate indicator of communication capability, both the invention of new ideas and the communication and use of new ideas. So that what is happening is that the human population is engaging in a game against nature in order to increase its numbers, and that science, technology, and communication are just the means whereby this coalition increases its capability. But that, th th basically, he says that's what has been happening over a period of thousands of years. <clears throat> so what Heinz would say is that technological development is associated with an increase in population, not a decrease in population. Now, the fascinating thing is that, that, that gives you two different relationships on your graph, all right? But they're looking at the same data. But they're looking at data from different regions over different periods of time. The demographers were looking at, say, Europe and Japan over a period of a few decades, and Heinz was looking at world population over a space of thousands of years. 
And that's what I find interesting in the scientific community, is that you can have groups looking at the same data coming up with diametrically opposed conclusions, which I find entertaining. My background is uh, geophysics. I did for years uh, scientific research in geophysics, and maybe that's why I'm a little bit more in informed than the others. And uh, what we can see is really trends which is uh, streaming somewhere which looks not very nice for the population in this world. And uh, this is something which is absolutely clear. The question is how strong is the impact of the human being uh, activity. But generally, 90% of scientists say, yes, there is some. Nobody knows uh, how to quantify, but generally mm -hmm. there is. So we have a equation, we have a system relation, we have a, a knowledge about the Earth's behavior, atmospheric behavior, but then there are people which are not listening. And the only disadvantage is that these people are policy and politics makers. Yes, right. And that's the problem. Yes, well, the, the problem of people not listening is, I think, um, uh, what can I say about that? Um, I was going to say something. Uh, the, the, the thought that I didn't complete when I was speaking about Heinz von Forster's doomsday equation is that he predicted that doomsday would happen in 2026, and which is essentially the same as the Club of Rome models, 2025. Um, but what he interpreted that was not that human population would go to infinity but rather that there would be a phase change in the relationship. That is, he interpreted it as a singularity, which occurs rather frequently in physics, um, like passing through Mach 1 in, in an aircraft or uh, ferromagnetism and so forth. You get these singularities, which indicate an instability. And that's, I think, the point that, that you were making, is that many analyses using a wide range of variables and a wide range of methods all indicate that we're approaching a phase change in the relationship between human beings and the planet. That there's been a long-term trend toward more people and more development, and that somehow we're going to have to make a phase change. Uh, ideally, toward population stability and rising per capita incomes based on declining consumption of resources. Um, but how to do that uh, when the political leaders want to just appeal to constituencies that have interests in the status quo uh, is going to be very challenging. One solution to that, which I referred to earlier, is that you decentralize decision making so that people in cities and states and communities and in homes can make adjustments uh, in advance of when the government leaders uh, get on board. Now, the government can obviously create incentives uh, for recycling and so forth, but in advance of that, you can do it anyway. Just and if I may add, if you see ice break, uh, or if you study ice break, you see 4% uh, percent of ice break, and the majority of it is below the water. And that's exactly how it is in the politics. Uh, the politicians are seenable, but behind them, is are sending the decision makers. Hmm. So it's not about the politicians, it's not about parties, it's about the people which are standing behind. Right. Nothing bad is irrelevant. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, let me go on uh, with this uh, discussion of system dynamics. Uh, <coughs> the person who has done the most to apply system dynamics to the study of organizational problems and promote that activity uh, is Peter Singe, who's a professor at MIT now. He studied with Forrester. He wrote a, a fairly popular book called The Fifth Discipline, uh, and he introduced it with an analogy to um, aircraft design. Uh, he noted that um, um, the Wright brothers proved in 1903 that you could have powered flight, but you didn't have commercially, economically sustainable powered flight until the DC-3, which came out, I think, in the 40s. And what the DC-3 did was that it combined um, 
a variable pitch propeller, uh, a rotary air-cooled engine, uh, retractable landing gear, flaps on the wings to provide stability at low speed, and a new fuselage design which provided uh, strong but lightweight construction. So his claim was that you had to have all five inventions and that if you only had four, uh, and there was one uh, plane that came out without flaps just before, it was not commercially viable. But if you had all five, then you crossed the threshold into viability. Sort of like with the internet. It worked, but it wasn't commercially viable until you had the internet and so on. So what Singe claims is that we're now approaching com commercially viable organizational learning technology. And he suggests that the elements of this package of ideas are personal mastery, mental models, shared vision, team learning, and systems thinking. And he emphasizes systems thinking. Personal mastery, he associates with an almost spiritual kind of thing. Uh, he's a Mormon and uh, mental models is what we've been talking about up to now in terms of um, models of the world. That is like the economist versus the ecologist. Can growth continue indefinitely on a finite planet or do you have to establish limits? Shared vision is trying to come together to create a shared vision and participatory methods that I described earlier are one way of creating that shared vision. And then team learning is partly the process improvement methods I described earlier and partly the group facilitation methods. Uh, systems thinking is what I have been talking about and I'll say more about now. Uh, he describes several uh, paradigmatic cases uh, of what goes on in organizations. Now, um, how, I assume that most of you don't know causal influence diagrams. Right. Okay, well, causal influence diagrams are the first step in creating a system dynamics model. What a causal influence diagram does is you write down variables and list links between the variables. And then you assign uh, a positive and negative sign to these links. Then you express those variables in an equation. Well, let's see. Uh, use it after you do the causal influence diagram like this. Then you write a level and rate diagram, which distinguishes variables by whether they are levels, rates, or auxiliaries. Then you write um, the equations. Then you have your computer simulation, and then you do testing. So you have your reference run, you do a lot of testing to create the reference run, and then you create policy alternatives and look at the consequences. So that's the sequence of steps in using uh, a computer simulation model, in this case, system dynamics. But the first step of causal influence diagrams is very, very useful, and you can use it in just reading a newspaper, uh, particularly uh, economics articles will say things like uh, exports rose and that leads to inflation and that leads to a government policy to do so and so and so forth. So if you read uh, columns and essays about the world economy or economics, very often you can make a pencil sketch of a causal influence diagram of what they're talking about. And very frequently what you'll find is that it's linear. That is, it doesn't complete the loop. And if you think about completing the loop, then you can go a step beyond the analysis in the article because social systems <coughs> act in such ways that uh, you do have these positive and negative feedback loops. So in an effort to make this method of analysis accessible to a large number of people, Singy went, in my judgment, too far by eliminating the positive and negative signs on the arrows and instead replacing them with a balance mechanism, which means negative feedback, and a snowball rolling down the hill, which indicates positive feedback. But in any case, <coughs> because I can't make these models without doing the positive and negative things, I think it's an essential part. One 
model, a basic model, is balancing process with delay. You take an actual condition, you take a corrective action, there's a delay, and that corrects the actual condition. So that, for example, you have uh, insufficient office space for a company. So you lease some more office space, build another building, and that improves the actual conditions. So that would be a negative feedback loop. So your problem leads to an action which reduces the problem. It's a very simple diagram. <coughs> Eroding goals. This is uh, a notion that um, you have a condition and then a gap uh, pressures to adjust the goal and the goal. So if you have a condition and actions to improve the condition, this is the loop we had before, but you have a gap between the goal and the gap, uh, or, or a gap between the goal and the condition, uh, there may be pressures to say, well, the goal is really not all that important and it's very expensive to build new buildings, etc. So you can have pressures to adjust the goal, which is one way of coping. Now escalation is most well known in terms of arms races. Um, you would think, perhaps intuitively, that if you want a certain number of bombers or missiles and you build bombers or missiles, there will come a time when you'll have enough and you'll stop building bombers or missiles. But if you have a two-person game, like the United States and the Soviet Union, uh, they interact in terms of A relative to B. So that if one side builds missiles, that increases the desire by the other side to build missiles, that builds missiles, which increases the desire of the first side to build missiles, and so you get an arms race. So, but the interesting thing is that both of these are negative feedback loops, which means that if you decouple them, they should level off. But because it's a relational goal, that is you want to have more missiles than the other side, you end up with uh, escalation. Another example is say you have a problem and a solution and that solves the problem. But if it doesn't solve the problem, then you can end up with unintended consequences. And here you have the symbol of the snowball running downhill which means positive feedback or growth. So that your attempt to fix the problem, if it creates additional problems, can exacerbate your problem. Well, for example, in the city, if you want to get someplace in the city, then you buy a car. Everybody buys a car, you get traffic congestion. So then you have to widen the roads, which makes the car more useful because you have better roads, so more people buy cars. So buying a car may be a fix to your personal problem, but you have unintended consequences. Growth and underinvestment. Um, if you have performance, perceived intent to invest, investment capacity, uh, greater capacity, you get a delay here, and then some performance standard, Demand is also a factor. So as demand increases, you may improve your performance and so forth, and, but then you get this growing action over here. So the demand leads to additional supply. I believe that this um, model was, intended, was created as a way of explaining the lack of long-term success of digital equipment. Digital equipment was a company that sort of grew out of the MIT research labs. Uh, and it was located in Boston near, uh, on Route 128, which is the sort of Silicon Valley of the Boston area. And uh, they seemed to have an image of computing that was always a little bit behind. On the one hand, they were highly innovative because they were always borrowing on the ideas from MIT and MIT engineers and so forth. On the other hand, they seemed to um, not invest enough or not anticipate the, the rapidity of the growth of the computer field. And so this was an effort to explain uh, why it is that digital equipment um, 
was eventually bought by, was it Compact and then Hewlett Packard, something like that. The limits to growth we've talked about before, you basically have, uh, oops, uh, growth in population. Um, so if you have a high birth rate, you get more people, which gives you a higher birth rate. Then a slowing action, which could be persistent pollution or rising per capita income, which reduces desire for children, uh, and so forth. So what this does is that it creates the classic S-curve, where first this curve is dominant, that gives you the growth, and then it levels off, that's the negative feedback loop. These are just variations. Um, you get a problem symptom, fundamental solution, symptomatic solution. Uh, the notion being you should focus your attention here, but you get a symptomatic solution which has the, a side effect which is undesirable. And then this is a question of shifting the burden to, uh, say, like an external advisor as opposed to creating capability within the organization. Here, what you want is to increase the capabilities of your internal actors. This is uh, a, a common problem in the allocation of funds. Uh, in the case of research in the United States, there might be a tendency to keep allocating funds to the major research universities, say like MIT, Caltech, Stanford, University of Michigan, and so forth. But because the funds are answerable to Congress, and congressmen come from different sectors, uh, the political system leads to a spreading of the money. Uh, this is also true in the manufacture of weapons systems, so that if, if the main contractor is in one state, then the engines are built in another state, and the weapon systems are built in another state. And by designing your aircraft, such that the components are built in many congressional districts, ideally the congressional districts of the members of the Armed Forces Committees in Congress, then you get approval of the weapon system. So that designing a weapon system is not just an engineering exercise, it's also a political exercise of assembling votes. And then the tragedy of the commons um, refers to an article by Garrett Hardin. How many of you have heard of the tragedy of the commons? Yeah, well, it's, it's the sort of general problem of the limits to growth, but it refers to the commons, which in the case of Boston, you can still see the commons. It's this green spot in the middle of Boston, and the idea was that anybody could graze their cows on the commons. That is, it belonged to everybody. Now the problem, of course, is that if everybody adds a cow to the commons, that gives a net gain to the owner of that cow, okay? So if he has two cows, he's going to put two cows on there because after all, the, the grass is free, right? He doesn't have to buy feed. And B is likely to do the same thing, so that B also puts cows on the commons. Well, eventually you're going to get a lot of cows on the commons which reduces the grass, which reduces the gain for each individual. So here you have a, a, a growth loop, but the larger consequence is a negative loop. Here you get a growth loop, larger consequence, limited group. So in that case, what you get is growth in cows on the commons, and then as you overgraze, you get overshoot and collapse. So the tragedy of the commons is that the lack of private ownership leads to depletion of the common resource, which is one argument for private property, is that each individual will manage their property in a more responsible fashion than if nobody, in a sense, owns the goods. Any questions? I would strongly recommend that you try to do these little causal influence diagrams. Uh, I find them extremely useful. I've used them to un understand social systems in, in many cases and find them very helpful. And in fact, in, in my earlier presentation last year, 
I talked about different ways of describing systems, that you could describe systems as interacting variables, as events, as ideas, or as groups. And I'll mention that in our last segment. But this is, in a sense, a, an explanation of looking at systems as variables. The notion being that different disciplines emphasize different ways of describing systems. So that physics and economics use variables. Events are used by history and, and computer science, like sequences of operations. Groups are spoken of by sociologists and political scientists. And ideas are used by psychologists, cultural anthropologists, and so forth. So that if you use, if you describe a system of interest in terms of all variables, you'll have a more complete description than if you just choose one method or one discipline. And the only person that I know of who routinely uses that method of analysis is George Soros, who's an extremely good analyst of social systems. If there are no questions, I propose a 15-minute break. <laughs>